All right, that's me. I'm Gregory Schmidt, and I am excited to be here, and I'm excited to see everyone else. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk to you specifically about what I'm trying to solve. Um, it's up there, and I hate, people, hate when people read to me. But how do I create a continuous test of my pre-production environment in a secured, simple, and almost most importantly, scalable way? Well, hang on, we'll get there. In order to get there, I've got to tell you a little bit about where I started and a little bit about me. By the way, my speaker notes are not on the thingamajig. Um, so the first of all, the real question is, who am I and what right do I have to, to talk to you? And you can't know who I am without knowing who these people are. This is my littlest, Jordan. If you ever need to find me at any point in the future, just search somewhere around her little finger, and I'm pretty sure I'll be right there. It's my oldest, Alexandra. My wife, Letitia. <sighs> That's Samson. That's my boy. And this guy here is Watson. Um, Samson is pretty much mine. Watson is my wife's. Uh, honestly, a dog like that, I can give him a hug and uh, I can watch my heart rate go down. That's, that's the kind of person I am. But besides that, the question becomes, how did I get to this stage? Um, I, I ended up uh, with two sort of sets of things that I'm going to talk about. Some soft skills and then some technical skills. And those are all things that I put in my toolbox to end up back here. Still don't have speaker notes. OK, they're not coming up. So I'm doing this blind. All right, you guys are in for a treat now because I had all this stuff prepared. And now I got no idea. All right, no worries. No worries. And I know it's, <laughs> I know it's kind of odd to, um, to say I put these things in a box because one of the things that we do in our craft is to think outside the box, to find the correct solution, right? But this is for illustrative purposes only. Some of the soft skills that I have are from before I ever got into IT or got into technology. I'll go over them really quickly. I am an Eagle Scout from Troop 521 in Mechanicsville, Virginia. Uh, I can start a fire with a shoelace and a pocket knife. I have spent a year and four months of my life in a tent not all in a row, that's, that's odd. <laughs> but one of the things that you will learn is that if you want to eat for a weekend, you will need to plan. You'll need to do checklists. You'll have to make sure you have equipment. You will have to make sure that raccoons don't ravage your coolers at some point during the weekend of camping. Or you'll be cold and hungry unless you know how to start a fire with a shoelace and a pocket knife. I also have a degree uh, Bachelor of Arts in Economics and History from the University of Richmond. And I, I don't know really what attracted me to economics at first. The, te the professors were pretty interesting. But I realized that what they're doing is trying to find efficient ways to use finite resources. And that spoke to me. And then I realized I need like 30 more hours to complete 122 to graduate, so I just added history for fun, because those teachers were way cooler than the English teachers, right? And then what I ended up doing was, during those last two years where I'm now juggling two majors, I found out that I needed to be able to manage my time in such a way that I get the biggest bang for my buck. And so in that, I developed a great love of efficiency. So that's the second tool that I put in there. The first one, leadership schools, efficiency for the second one, or a love of efficiency. And then, during my time, I also became a high school teacher. I ended up leaving that field not because of the students, trust me, I loved it. And they were some of the most incredible people that humbled me beyond belief. But I learned something there, probably more from them than they ever taught me, as cliched as it sounds to say, that one, no two people learn anything the same in any fashion. You can present the cradle of civilization, Tigris and Euphrates rivers, in five different ways, and somebody still might not get it. But it's your job to make sure that they do. So along that route, what we ended up with was an intense need to be flexible. So I added a lot of flexibility to that, because it doesn't matter how the student gets there, just that they do. OK, so I do work at Capital One. I'll make sure I didn't skip one there, no. I do work at Capital One, and 
I, I want to cover before, actually, let's stick on this one for a second. So before I got to Capital One, I did a lot of other things. I have been a bouncer. I have um, been a teacher. I worked on cars, served subpoenas. I was a college cheerleader for 11 years. It's not NCA regulated, so it's one of those things you can kind of slip in. Coached cheerleading, yeah. No, I mean, it's a, I've seen, I've had the best seats from some of the, the best basketball games you can ever picture in your life. Um, but then, as you saw in my, one of my first slides, fatherhood loomed not too long ago. So I decided I needed a real job with real benefits, and I decided to contract for what I thought was a credit card company. That's what we think. And I very quickly found out that they are actually a technology company that happens to support a bank. They spend a lot of time working on their people, their infrastructure, and the technology in order to change banking in such a way to make it simple and intuitive for the average customer. And what I found out very quickly was, one, I wanted to convert to be an associate longer than my contract, and two, I wanted to be a voice for change. All right. So where do we start? Five years ago, you got a picture up here, a bucket of cell phones and two thumbs for this guy. <laughs> and the reason I bring that up, those two images, are because that's all we needed at that point. I started out in the mobile space, and it might seem crazy, but five years ago, this was new and exciting for the banking industry to have a mobile app to access these things. Are you kidding me? But I bring up the bucket of cell phones because each one of those represented a different operating system and you'll notice that there's Blackberries on top. So yes, we had to test Blackberries, uh, which pretty much no longer exists. But they each represent something that our customer would hold in their hands, and then thumbs, because that and time was all I needed to make sure that we were completing our testing. You might recognize that cell phones can offer some limitations, like they need to be charged, updated, etc. So the time became a factor. We had to find ways to iterate, as you see, we're not really releasing all that often, and our testing window was really just how fast can we test. That's not an ideal situation, even five years ago. Um, I've got some little guy here. I don't know, this is my terrible stick figure with Microsoft Draw, but so we're sort of telling where we are in the story. These are the early tools. Fast forward a year or two after that, and I switched teams to something that is web-based. We're looking at our typical www.capitalone.com, right? That's where we are. And some of the key factors in this were the tools that we had. We still had various combinations of browsers and operating systems, and we did find out very early that it is technically illegal to force your customers to download and use just one browser on one operating system, right? Because that would be great. God, that would be fantastic. But you can't do that. So what we ended up with was virtual machines. And virtual machines were fantastic for their time. We had a group that was dedicated to keeping them in certain configurations, right? iOS 6, or uh, IE6. Oh man, we only stopped supporting IE6 like, like two or three years ago, so whew. IE6 on Windows XP, all the fun stuff. And then we also started our Agile journey. Were we perfect at it? No. But we looked at it as a method to start decreasing the iterations that it took to get something out the door. And with Agile, there was some, like you have people that are manual testers. I was hired as a manual tester, and I was used to getting something much later in the process. With Agile, I was finding I was getting my stuff a little bit later in the sprint, and we sort of had to improve on this. So we weren't perfect at Agile at first, but it is something that will become important later. And then we did start toying with Selenium, because we had this enormous backlog on this big app that we couldn't make test inside of a small enough window to make everybody happy. So we created ETAF, Enterprise Testing Automation F something. I can't even remember what it was. But it was keyword based. It used Selenium. You had um, three laptops and like a control node and you'd make this all work. And it was okay. It was a very good first step because we're able to get a day's worth of testing down to a couple of hours, right? We still had several days worth of testing, but that was something that we had to do. As we fast forward a little bit more, I, I don't know where to point this. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. We're gonna come up to the recent years. 
So now we've, we started out with some cell phones and some thumbs. We dabbled with a little bit of automation. And now we have something called Yibiyoy. You build it, you own it. And so we now have these agile teams. We started out with just four in my group. I think we have something like 22 now. Which necessarily means that you can't have this old habit of tossing something to a health and hygiene team after 90 days warranty. Right? That becomes untenable when 12 teams are giving some new team, I mean not a new team, but a health and hygiene team, something that they have to maintain in production. So we found a lot of benefits to this for us. When we build it, there's no question about who to go to for questions if you want to onboard as a client to this service, if there's a problem in production, uh, or, or any of those things. We also ended up with just this, a deeper knowledge. So my team has been working on the enterprise forgot password and forgot username since January of last year. Like we own this, we're hardening this, we're working on it. It's ours, we own it. People know who to talk to about this. The release cadence I'm gonna leave up for a little bit. You can tell that we're at a point now where we can pretty much release almost anywhere. And I've got about five more tools that I wanna talk about before we get to the end. And I'll show you how they all fit together because this is where we are now in the recent years. But I want you to understand that you build it, you own it, is the driver for the rest of these tools. Can you advance, please? Thank you. Some of this might look familiar. Um, I don't know, I just thought this was a funny way to put the pictures up, whichever. <laughs> these are all kind of subsets of each other, right? So you can't really talk about Ruby without realizing that, okay, Cucumber was written for Ruby, and Gherkin is a subset of that. But if you haven't seen this before, I want to talk to you a little bit about why these are important. Cucumber is, was written for Ruby. It does work now with several other languages, but it is the piece that lets you run your features. It allows a couple things. If you notice, uh, there's actually an error on the screen. Um, this is what you use to launch your tests. Right? So this is something that your tester would need to understand, but maybe your product owner necessarily does not. Right? We're going to get to different parts of these, and different parts of the Agile team. We use Scrum, for, for instance. We'll be using different parts of this. Gherkin is the parser. Gherkin has about 10 reserved words to it. I can't remember exactly. But Gherkin's beauty, and that's what this is. It's sort of a subset of that. It's the parser for Cucumber, and it allows you to use plain business text, absolutely plain business text, that a, a product owner can understand without, making, without having to understand Ruby or Java or whatever it is that you're going to do on the bottom end. So in this case, I've got a feature, a scenario, and I say, given the user is on the home page, when the user clicks forgot username, then the forgot username and page is loaded. That's a test. Not a particularly exciting test, but nonetheless, it's a test. What this does, it points each one of these lines, each one of these keywords, given, when, then, and uh, feature and scenario are also um, keywords. They point to a, a starting location in your Ruby code. So do I have a laser pointer? Am I not smarter than this? Probably not. It's OK. All right, it's fine. So underneath of all that, I have Ruby. Ruby was released to the public in 1995. It was an open source project. It was written by Mats. I can't remember how to say his last name. By a nice guy, Mats. He released it. It's gone open source. Yeah, I mean, he's the guy. Like, he wrote it. It's got a lot of support. It's, thanks. Yeah, thank, seriously, thanks, Mats. But it, it's the, talking about Ruby is its own hour long seminar. But what's important to note here, if you're trying to pick a language, it is elegant. It is powerful. Oh, perfect. It's elegant, it's powerful, and it's a scripting language. So it's much easier for you to test your tests. You can write them very quickly and then just click go and say, oh, did I get that right? Because remember, we were all manual testers, and suddenly we're being expected to jump into this. My leadership was very good about saying, hey, we will train you instead of finding new versions of you. Like, that was great. They're like, oh, thank you, job. I'm a dad now. So in that particular case, uh, Ruby is very straightforward. Cool. Ruby is very straightforward. It's easy to learn. It's very powerful. Um, and it works with, plays very nicely with some of the other tools. Really wish I had my notes. Sorry. Anyway, so these are the three pieces of that. 
I'll show you how they all fit together in a second. I'm not smarter than this thing. Okay, here's some more tools. Um, GitHub is a repository version control, and we do use Git, GitHub for Enterprise. GitHub itself is open source. We use GitHub for Enterprise. You don't have to, but we are a bank, and we take protecting our intellectual property and potentially the property of you know, people's usernames or passwords. Has that been in the news at all? I'm trying to remember. Yeah. We want to protect that, so we use GitHub for Enterprise on our own servers. And what that allows me to do is start a testing suite and then collaborate with my testing peers. They have a very powerful function of this called the pull request. In the pull request, someone else takes the code down, makes some adjustments, and says, hey, I'd like you to merge this with this. And you end up with this beautiful collaboration for your tests. Second half of this that we use is Jenkins. Jenkins was forked from Hudson. It is now open source. It's released under the MIT license. And it is the automation server that we use. Um, Jenkins is a very good a friend of mine. And Jenkins lets me do a lot of great things. Jenkins lets me sleep while he runs my tests. Le oh, no, 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 no. I get to sleep. That's right. I get to sleep while Jenkins runs my tests. Um, he's like a huge if this then that scenario. You can set him up with all kinds of hooks, excuse me, with all kinds of plugins. He works with GitHub. He works with many other things. Jeez, uh, I can't even think of all of them right now, but we'll move on. Because I'll show you how they all fit together in just a little bit. So remember before when we used a Selenium grid? Selenium grid? Well, Capital One has partnered with a fantastic company that provides the largest cloud-based Selenium grid. They are on when I need them. They are, some of you more hip can guess which one we use. Like, I'm not sure if that's all clear or not, but I'm technically not allowed to say it out loud. Uh, they are on when we need them. They provide secure access to these browsers. They are clean versions, and they spin up very quickly, and they play nicely with, they play nicely with tons of languages, but since we use Ruby, that's the one that's important to me. So Capital One has started to work with a Selenium grid in the cloud. There we are. And the last thing that we want to mention, as, as far as it fits, is our cloud-based infrastructure. We've teamed with a very large company that has given us the opportunity to, instead of fill out a request for a server, get vice presidential approval, send it off, put it in a rack, <laughs> right? Try to get your build on it, which takes three or four months. We now just spin up a server in the cloud. And that makes a huge difference when your developers can just say, I'm gonna build you this, run your tests on that. So where do all these pieces fit together? That's kind of why we're here. There's going to be an infographic in just a second. It is, and by the way, I don't know really how to do the fancy animations to show you one piece at a time, so just ignore my PowerPoint failures and, oh, too far, come, come on. Here we go. One of the reasons that, if we look at the original question was how do we do this in a scalable way? And I mentioned very briefly tags on the Gherkin, Cucumber, and Ruby page. So picture each one of these really fancy stick figures that I did in Microsoft Draw, or Paint, rather, as a team. And each one of these people writes their own tests. I write my tests, I tag them with either forgot username, forgot password. Our login team will tag their test with login, login Canadian customer, login UK customer, login COAF customer. That's the only place where this system has a big chance of breaking down is if someone decides that inside their group they need 50 different sub-tags, it can get highly frustrating. But what that means is we all store them up in our GitHub for Enterprise. And then, anytime Jenkins, either I tell him to run a test, or in our case, he notices that there is uh, a new bit of code inside, that, that, that a build got completed for one of our cloud-based infrastructure servers, he will run the test. And he might say, huh, that's really cool. Why don't you just run the test? Well, when it's 10 o'clock in the morning, that's perfectly fine. But this is why if Jenkins were a real person, I'd buy him beer all the time, is that Jenkins can be told to run this stuff at 3 in the morning. Or if some other team says, hey, we're changing the front page, and we need integration validation 
based on people run, like, accessing the forgot username flow through our front page. I'll be like, here's my job in Jenkins. You can look at the report afterwards and see if it actually worked or not. So he comes down. Jenkins make, oh, starting to point that the right way. <laughs> Technology's hard. Jenkins will actually come down, grab our scripts, put them on a node, run them against our environment. Our environment will call out to our cloud-based Selenium grid and then spit out the test results. And the end result for me, to put it into to a number from where we used to release every now and again, is that I can be ready for a release in a day based on what the code changes are. The way we have it set up, we have an if this, then that. That's basically what he is, if this, then that. He will notice that there is a build to test within 30 minutes, and he will run my scripts for me and let me know if they work. And that's pretty powerful for me. So we've come a long way from where we started, which was a bucket of cell phones and two thumbs, releasing every now and again to where I can do this in about a day. Now, if you don't have all of these tools, that's fine. If you don't need all these tools, that's fine. The idea here was that you could see where we were, where we're coming. Maybe you're somewhere in the middle. Maybe you're somewhere further along. Maybe you're looking at what I put up here and I'm like, what was that guy thinking? I'm like, mm, I don't know. So this is what it comes down to, our solution and bullet points. I'm going to pause for like 10 seconds because I'm just not going to talk over that. Okay. And then the question becomes, where are we now? Where are we going to go? Well, I know I've got some, uh, I've got some stuff in the pipeline. I'm going to be adding some visual automated testing to some of my validations uh, Monday when I get back. Very excited about that addition to it. Uh, all right, that's fine. So here's the summary. I started with some soft skills. Now, the question for you and your company becomes, do you necessarily have to go find Eagle Scouts with econ and history degrees? No. Find people with broad, rich backgrounds and rich perspectives. Trust your process for hiring the best people. Because I did not start life as a tester. I started life with I think I had one stint on the Y2K project 20 years ago or whatever. But I ended up OK. What I had was something that I could offer my company. But this is what we did. We started with some physical devices. We started changing and evolving, trying to find the best ways to serve our customers. And now we have a process that lets us have them very quickly. But what's next? I don't know. But I plan to be there for that, because uh, I do like it and it helps feed my kids. <laughs> Either way, I'm Gregory Schmidt. I do have time for some questions and answers. We do have a roving microphone, uh, which somewhere, if anyone has a questions or would like to ask one, I'll do my best. Yeah, what sort of resources did you use personally and maybe with your team to help with the transition of manual testers and getting them on board with things like CI and CD and uh, onboarding with Selenium? Now, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it because my group was a little bit unique. So for some reason, a lot of the testers already had like computer science degrees. And then there was me, economics and history. But what we, what we understood to happen and what we made very clear to our leadership was that velocity, which is a measure of how quickly you complete your stories or how quickly you produce, would take a hit. Right? We got to this point where we had a backlog of something like 2,500, 3,000 test cases. And we started to automate them because we couldn't afford not to. We could not afford that two-week testing window, right? And then as, as they started to see the benefit to it, for instance, we, we obviated the need. We did our regression first. We worked our way through that. We actually got some specific automation engineers in to go line by line with the test cases, the manual test cases that were there, and just build this. And it sounds crazy because it sounds like it would take forever, but each, each week was a little faster, and a little faster, and a little faster. The instant savings were that we did not need an offshore team to help us complete our regression testing. Um, so I guess, all right, let me, I'm talking too much. The key things were that leadership had to understand that delivery was gonna slow down while you got into this groove. If they're not on board with that, or if agile means to somebody that you can have whatever you want in 90 days and change your mind every two weeks, 
it's going to be a tougher uphill battle. Does that sort of cover what we wanted to do? Basically, you had to make your leadership understand it's going to take a hit, but we're all good, smart people, and we can do it. Okay? Yes, sir. How do you handle um, concurrency of changes between teams? So if you're doing your testing on, on your particular uh, login application, as an example, but that needs to coincide with changes that are going into the website in general, or changes to the mobile app, or changes to the back end system, how are you syncing all that testing together into one concurrent launch? We don't really do concurrent launches. Um, we use what's called a, we use a system of toggling. So we will create um, some microservices. We definitely have moved away from a big monolithic app into APIs, REST services, those kinds of things. And then the key to this, and believe me, the, just the, like the key in any sort of business thing is communication. So since if you build it, you own it, my tech lead, my product owner, and my scrum master all know who to contact and say, look, Four weeks from now, or six weeks from now, we are going to make this change. We're going from version 4 to version 5 on our API. If you could, let us know what your impacts are, and then be prepared to do a smoke test or a regression test for us. The communication for smoke testing or regression testing, that communication will typically fall to me. So I'll contact them and let them know, hey, I'm going to need to sign off from you before I let this thing fly. We can put stuff in production either with a toggle, and then come the night that the person that's going to use it, we essentially just switch traffic to that or change the toggle. Does that? OK. okay. Anything else? I've recently been looking at uh, the Hygea project developed by Capital One uh, for test dashboarding and reporting. How does that all fit in? How does uh, looking at the test results and monitoring fit in with your, del uh, your development and delivery strategy? I cannot speak to that. And it's not like I cannot because I'm restricted, but because I'd be talking about something I don't really have a firm grasp on. Um, and the reason for that is, oh, you're from Capital One. Do you know Steve? And I'm like, no, there's like, there's like 40,000 of us. And so we're here in San Francisco and Chicago and New York and Northern Virginia and, and Central Virginia, and we're scattered hither and yon. I know that it exists. I know that it's a contribution for the, um, to the open source community. But beyond that, I can't speak to it, other than I don't use it yet. Thank you. No worries. Yes. Um, I think recently we tried to implement Cucumber with um, just having one Base business feature file that would be used by developers, business analysts, and testers. And one of the pain points we ran into is uh, just creating user stories, but keeping them on a, a little bit of a higher level so that testers can relate to it, business analysts can relate to it, developers can relate to it. And uh, yeah, and so I was just wondering what's been your experience and what are some of the challenges that you've run into and how have you approached Resolve? Uh, we have had a great time with that. Talk about opportunities galore. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, so when I mentioned earlier that we started our agile journey and that it was a little bit tougher for us, that was one of the, th I mean, in fact, we started a little bit beyond that. We started, when we first started, there was uh, a BSA story, a development story, and then a testing story. And we very quickly sort of, the fight for that or the, the request for change from that sort of had to come from the bottom up. I said, look, we want all of this to be into one story, one, one thing that we can deliver. And so that is an ongoing process for us. And it happens in planning. It happens in, I guess, some people, are you, are you running Agile? Are you, okay. Yes. Is everyone attend the grooming session? Yes. Okay. Our role as the QE is to be thinking about two weeks ahead of even just the grooming. So when the grooming comes in, you should be thinking, what kind of data do I need? Is this small enough? Do we have acceptable acceptance criteria? And what we found, which has just worked for us, it might not work for you, is that no one person writes the gherkin. We all write the gherkin. We make sure that our stories are small enough that 
for instance, uh, anyway, the one about the home page. When we started out with uh, revamping our enterprise, forgot username and forgot password, that one that you saw, when a user is on the forgot, is on the, and then they click the forgot username page, then that opens, that would be one story. Is it perfect? No. For your team, that might be too small. But what we did find is it doesn't take long before, it doesn't take long or a whole lot of, I can fit one more thing into this story, then I can fit one more thing, until you've got an eight point story that you really can't finish in one sprint effectively. So I, my answer to you would be, good communication inside the grooming session with hit and miss. That's become a focus of our team was to try to get our stories right sized. And then your code will work. Did I answer that correctly or is there something else? No, that, yeah, that answers it. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, the microphone's coming. Sorry. I have one over here. In the oh, I'm sorry. You know what? Uh, yes, yeah, so you mentioned you are using Jenkins to run your test. Mm -hmm. Have you um, uh, evaluated any other options than Jenkins at that time? We've evaluated a couple. But Capital One has decided, I mean, from on high, from VP on down, to make a push for the open source community and to support it as strongly as possible. It meets our needs, and it does great. So we use a Cloud Bees version of Cloud Bees Jenkins. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, I was wondering if uh, you could explain how you manage the test data uh, behind your tests. Okay. We have, we have a group inside Capital One called Test Data Management. Um, to give you a brief history, so Capital One at its beginning was just a credit card company, which is very simple because we would have very homogenous data. It's all the same. You had a credit card company. But as we started to um, expand our portfolio, each of those companies, uh, so home loans, for instance, or, or car loans or um, online banking, they all came with their own system of record. And as such, each of those people came with their own username and password. So there was a time there where you could conceivably go to Capital One, and if you had a home loan, an auto loan, and um, you know, a credit card, you might have three different usernames and passwords. We recognized that was not the best experience for our customers, so we worked to condense those and collapse users under one, under one. But what that meant behind the scenes, to answer your question, was there is a separate team whose only job is to provide us with test data. And they've done an incredible, just sort of they're not here, but I'll give them a shout out. They've got APIs that I can use to go get my test data. I can work with them directly, but they have a, they've got an app inside our, inside our system where I can just go and get it. But in the early days, yes, uh, environments and data were one of my worst pain points. Up here. Hi. So since I saw that you moved from all manual to all automated tests, how did you come up with those tests saying that this is enough? Because I keep getting questions from my manager saying, what percentage have we covered? What percentage have we covered? I really don't have an answer to it. Maybe it's a gut feeling that we have covered all smokes and all regression. But how do you come up with that number to the leadership saying, you know, we have covered everything? All right, I technically have 53 seconds left, so that's a big one. So how to recover everything? That's the beauty of this. When we first started, we thought we all needed those 2,500 test cases. We absolutely don't. And the idea behind percent complete, you'll have to find a way to effectively communicate to your leadership that maybe that's not the best because any flaw or any bug could be hiding in that 0.01%, right? So one of the things that we do is, as I mentioned earlier, with the story, with the the gherkin is everybody agrees to that and then everybody on the team becomes the risk owner and if you meet that if you meet that story then you can mark that story closed and so you can say i've done what you've asked the next best great step though is and as as any great qas you know we all want to become experts in the thing that we're testing is to say hey you know what what would happen if this credit, so I can use my example, if this credit card user has a charged off account and a new car loan, will we be able to see them? Will they be able to reset their password? And so you, your job then becomes to sort of point out the edge cases and then make sure that they get their stories. So the best answer I can give to you 
is to move away from percent complete, but I mean, I can't tell you how to do something, and start to accept the story. Um, all right, and let me, let me take 30 more seconds. I know we're done. Uh, I ought to go back a different. So in the early years, in the early tools, when we, or in the middle years when we started to make those changes, we actually got together with people inside my group that were QEs and decided what our core functions were and then went and found just the test cases that covered those and then culled the rest and made sure that those got automated first. So we get 80% of our testing done and then every, the other 20% are your edge cases, right? Because it even comes down to money. Let's say it takes you three days to test all those edge cases. And in order to solve one user's, one user's problem, it takes a $4 phone call to a call center. Well, that certainly wasn't worth four developers times three days times two testers, right? Pay the four bucks at some point, and then we'll just sort of move on, right? Perfect is really tough to do. But I'm sorry, I'm way out of time. Um, I'll be around if you want to talk to me afterwards. And I can't thank you enough for coming to my session. Thank you. <laughs>